few things to mention. I've just got a few things to mention relating to the branch. Um, so we're always on the lookout for new committee members. Um, and uh, we don't usually get a flood of people re responding to my request, but I'm going to try it again. Um, yeah, always looking for fresh committee members. And uh, we did briefly last year have a publicity officer um, and a social media officer. And um, it'd be very good to have a publicity officer in, in helping us out. Um, just to raise the file um, of butterfly it, 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 very good. Good. Hmm. So. The mouse is showing up. Um, I'll go. Right. Um, and uh, so if anyone's interested in helping out with the branch committee in any way, um, mm -hmm. then uh, please get in touch with me. Uh, my contact will be in, if you've got a copy of Checkered Skipper, it will be in there, or my contact details will be on the branch website. And uh, I'll probably put the, the kind of roles, like the publicity officer and social media officer roles, I'll probably get the descriptions of what people are required to do for those roles, get them put on the branch website um, so that people can see those. Um, and in terms of events for this coming season, uh, we don't have a huge number lined up, but we do have several field trips planned. Uh, details of those will be either in the Checkered Skipper or on the branch website. And if any new ones come along, uh, they will go onto the branch website. So do keep an eye on that from time to time. Uh, this Spring meeting used to be an AGM as well as a, uh, a chance to hear a few talks. Um, so it's no longer an AGM of, as such. And, uh, but I'll just say that if anyone wants to see the accounts of the branch, then um, if you contact Audrey Turner, um, she can let you have a copy of the accounts. Um, just to yeah, bring you up to date with a couple of things that we've been working on recently. Um, I mentioned last year that we were working on a new distribution atlas for uh, butterflies of highlands and islands. Um, so it's been uh, a bit of a slow progress, mostly due to me dragging my heels over doing some text, but uh, we're very, very close now. And uh, if I can just share my screen, hopefully I'll give you a sneak preview of this. So this isn't the finished item, but it's very, very close to being finished. And many thanks to uh, Audrey Turner in particular for putting this together. Um, right, that's not a good start. Bear with me. Right. Can folks see that? No. No. What are you seeing at the moment? Just you. Just me. Yeah, that's bad. <laughs> um, right, I've clicked on share and I've opened up the atlas, so I don't know why you're not seeing it. Tom might need to allow you to other participants to share screen. Tom, if you go into share screen, there, there's a, a box comes up. I can't remember exactly what it says, but it's, it's something along the, the lines of allowing other participants to share screen. Yeah, that, uh, that's already clicked. That's that's already clicked. Okay. I've turned it on and off just as uh, you know the classic uh, technology uh, fix. Yeah. So you can Indeed. Try that, that that's not the problem.
let me uh, let me try again then. Yeah, that's working, Pete. Aha, uh -huh, right. Although that's we've got uh, your uh, desktop rather than the. Right. Oh, yeah. How's that? Okay. That's, that's good. You might want to right. make it full screen. Um. That's as big as I can get it at the moment. Is, have you just got a tiny picture, or uh, no? We've got we've got most of it. We've, we've got just most got of it. The, right. We've just got okay. The column down the right. But, uh, you could yeah. get rid of that by clicking the little arrow. Oh, how's that? The little arrow. Yeah, below your mouse. Keep going down. Yeah, that one. Uh -huh. That's it. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so. No, no, let's not risk that. <laughs> okay, so uh, right, so here's right. So this is just um, yeah, this is just the first page, uh, the the kind of title page, um, introduction. You don't want to read that, right? So um, just the first species up here is dingy skipper. Um, so this this is will be typical of the layout for the atlas. So you have your species here, nice picture, um, and then the text, and then the map, and the map will have records up to and including 2019. And um, for those species that are found in the in Shetland and Orkney, uh, you'll also have a map for them. But in this particular example, Dingy Skipper. Um, there are no records from the Northern Isles. And um, the, the old paper atlas, for those of you who've seen that, which was including records up to 2007, um, the, the Western Isles and the Northern Isles weren't included in the old atlas. It was just Highland, Mainland plus Murray. Um, so I'm delighted that with our uh, new atlas, um, those people from the Isles can actually uh, see their distribution maps as well. So, um, and then below the distribution map, we'll have um, the number of records in the database, uh, the uh, phenology graph. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mike Taylor, for sorting these phenology graphs out. And then, um, and then a few photographs at the bottom of the page to finish. So each species will have its own page so that potentially you can download and print these off onto an A4 sheet of paper um, if, if you want. And um, you'll notice here that um, on quite a number of these species, Audrey has put in a request for more photographs of species. Um, we're keen to get photographs of both adults and, but also if you have any larvae, uh, any caterpillars um, or even uh, pupae or eggs, um, then we'd be interested for. And uh, Audrey is particularly looking for photographs for uh, mountain ringlet, clouded yellow, purple hair streak, and Camberwell beauty. Um, and you can tell by that list, they're either uh, elusive or very rare. So you can see why we're short to them. But if you have any decent photographs for any of these species, um, if you can, as it says here, get in touch with Audrey and um, check it, Skipper. I'll just take you quickly through the next one. So as you see, same format, text in a nice picky, and then the map. So for um, a few selected species where there's a restricted distribution, um, we have a uh, map. The map on the left is five kilometers squares. And uh, so most of the maps, well, all of the maps will have that resolution showing, uh, but for some species we'll um, zoom in. And this is this map on the right is the 2km uh, square resolution map. Um, just to give a bit more 
detail and make it easier to see. Um, again, obviously, there are no records from the uh, Northern Isles, so there's no map for that. And then your phonology chart and more pickies to finish with. So that's the format. Um, and as I say, many thanks to Audrey for um, putting that together. And um, well, a special thanks also for Patrick Cook of Butterfly Conservation, who he did all the graphs, uh, sorry, all the maps for us uh, and in his own time, not in butterfly conservation time. So Patrick did a great job with that. So this, this will be on the uh, website uh, in due course. Just come out of that. And um, so the other, the other thing I just wanted to mention briefly was um, uh, we did a um, couple of work parties at Logie Quarry up towards Tain uh, back in the last, the last autumn winter. And um, Logie Quarry is uh, a disused quarry, a sand and gravel quarry. And uh, when it became abandoned, and no longer being used for business, uh, there was a huge amount of kidney vetch and bird's foot trefoil growing there. And obviously the sandy, gravelly substrate in the quarry was just perfect for these plants to grow. And they are the food plants for um, small blue and dingy skipper butterflies. And over the years, um, there's been a lot of tree and scrub regeneration on this site um, so that um, the areas, it used to be very extensive areas of kidney vetch and um, birds for trefoil, but these eventually got shaded out by the trees. Um, so there were very few areas left. Um, so the butterflies were basically being pushed into ever shrinking areas. Um, Tom, has done a brilliant job um, getting funding from the Highland Council's Nature Restoration Fund. Um, and he got money to pay for contractors to go in and um, do a lot more work of what we, we'd started doing a little bit by hand with our work parties, but the contractors have just obviously um, gone in blitzed much bigger areas, areas that we, we would have taken years to do. So um, the contractors were working in March. This is one of the areas you can see that they've been uh, working on. And this is an aerial shot looking down onto one of the clearings. And um, you can see the contractor's vehicle at work here. So they're basically um, using clearing saws to cut through a lot of the scrub and then chipping the, the felled material. Um, so that's really taking shape well. And um, this is a quick video of the chipper in action. And you can see the piles of cut scrub here. So this area should become well colonized by the um, food plants of small blue and uh, dingy skipper. Brilliant. And uh, I'll keep losing my, my cursor. And this is a map Tom sent me. So this is like an aerial shot, obviously, of Logie Quarry. And the, the orange patches in this are areas that are going to be cleared. And then the um, tr there, there's a system of tracks and paths leading through the this area. Um, and these yellow lines are some of the tracks through. And they are going to be um, cut uh, wider so um, the rides will be opened up and those will link the cleared areas so that butterflies can move hopefully from one area to another. So um, it's absolutely great to see work being done on a, a decent scale. Many, many thanks to Balnagown Estate uh, for letting us do this work and Tom has developed a good relationship with uh, Callum, the estate factor, and they seem quite sympathetic uh, and supportive uh, to the work that's going on there. Uh, 
Um, so great to see it happening and using local contractors as well. So um, that's the that that's Logie Quarry. So and uh, we have a field trip happening in Logie Quarry um, in June. So I'm hoping that uh, some of you will be able to join us there. Okay. Um, oh yeah. Oh, I'll just add uh, uh, that Tom's also hoping to get more money from uh, Nature Scots Nature Recovery Fund. Um, and that money will be used for dark border beauty work, um, primarily in Straths Bay. And we're hoping to uh, increase the number of sites in Straths Bay where dark border beauty is found. And uh, also hopefully coming on stream will be Species on the Edge, uh, which you may have heard of. Um, so this is a big joint uh, partnership uh, project between RSPB, Butterfly Conservation and various other folk and uh, that there's there's a lot of butterfly work uh, going to be as part of that project. So that's things that hopefully will be coming along in the next couple of years, well next year hopefully, um, if the funding is there. Okay, um, that's enough for me just now. Um, Let's get on to some talks. So first speaker up is Steve Wheatley. And um, Steve was Butterfly Conservation's Regional Conservation Manager for Southeast England uh, for seven years. Um, so uh, Tom and I have uh, obviously come across Steve uh, in the past, uh, but Steve does have a connection with the Highlands. Um, he has previously worked for Trees for Life at Findhorn, and he's also done some work for RSPB. And he has just relocated from Southeast England to Inverness, uh, which was a very smart move, Steve. Um, <laughs> yeah, very well done. And Steve is hoping to uh, get involved with uh, the Highland branch of BC. Uh, now he's up here as a resident. So, Steve's talk is going to look at some of the species he's left behind in Kent, and I think he's going to give us a quick look at also at some of the species he hopes to see in this coming season as a uh, as a Highland resident. So um, thank you very much, Steve. I shall hand over to you. Thanks, Pete. Okay, I'll, um, I'll try and share my screen now. Okay, has that worked? Yes, that's good. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You've yeah. You've um. You've stolen my introduction. That was everything I was going to say in my <laughs> in my introduction. So thank you for explaining it so well, and thanks for inviting me to to speak at your meeting. Um, I get really nervous at things like this, so um, I don't know why I volunteer to do them, but um, do let me know if I start speaking too quickly or or rambling. So. As Pete said, my you know my talk here is about relocating from southeast England to the north of Scotland, and hopefully these two pictures kind of sum up my my thinking behind it. As, as Pete says, it's you know a, a good thing to do, so I, I hope he's right with that. <clears throat> right, um, if I can just move the slide on. Right, so. As was mentioned, I was the um, regional conservation manager for Southeast England for butterfly conservation. So that's the area that I used to cover. Um, that includes Kent, Sussex, Surrey, Hampshire, Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire, um, and Berkshire. And what I've done is I've taken the, uh, the big step to flutter northwards and head up into the, um, into the highlands and islands. I did work for Trees for Life um, um, a few years back and just completely loved it. I kind of got dragged that back down south. We got to work with butterfly conservation down south. So it was, um, you know, it was great working down there, but really exciting for me to be back up here again. Um, about two weeks ago, I was in Surrey and I saw my first holly blue of the year. And I was really excited. 
um, for fantastic, you know, spring has started. And then what I kind of realized is it's probably my last holly blue of the year because looking at the distribution map, there's no holly blues up here. So um, that kind of brought home what I had suddenly committed to, um, to do um, uh, when, I, when I told Buffalo Conservation that I was leaving. Um, another, um, another set of species, and what I'll do is I'll run through some of the species that I won't be seeing and also some of the species that I hope to see. Um, so the, the hair street butterflies, obviously there's, um, there's, there's, there's five species, um, and down in the south of England, most of these are fairly ubiquitous. Um, the area there is where the black hair streak occurs. And um, so in that area in particular, that's the one area of the UK where all five hair streaks occur in the same area. And we've been um, running a project there called Five Hair Streaks, um, working with, uh, with various partners to, uh, to promote the hair streaks and the conservation of all of these but in particular the black hair streak. And um, there's big issues like the um, HS2 development, which is run straight through this area and is obviously causing a lot of disruption. Uh, so the brown hair streak and the black hair streak are ones that um, are very southeast based. So we're, uh, you know, I'm not likely to see those this year. Looking at the other three, the green hair streak, obviously, as you, you know, I'm sure most of you have seen green hair streak up there, and I've seen more green hair streak in Scotland than I ever have in Southeast England. Um, white letter hair streak is, is moving northwards. And certainly since this map was produced in 2014, has, has jumped across the border and is, is marching up through Scot uh, the south of Scotland now. And purple hair streak seems to have seemed to sort of creep just about into the Highlands. Uh, area, but um, I think we're, are we going to hear some more about, about that later? Okay, another another really beautiful butterfly that um, I'm not going to get to see again this year is, is Adonis Blue. And as Southeast Regional Conservation Manager, um, my area covered about 50% of the Adonis Blue population um, in the UK. And this is the kind of habitat that it likes. This is a site in West Sussex one of the best sites in, in the UK for the Adonis Blue. And it likes these really short, really um, dry, um, chalk grassland slopes. This is in the South Downs National Park. Um, and you can see hundreds and potentially thousands of Adonis Blues flying um, uh, in this area. Another species I'm not gonna see this year is Heath Artillery. I've been doing lots of work on Heath Artillery um, over the last five years, and we've we've achieved with the, with the woodland managers in the southeast unprecedented results for this species. Um, twenty twenty was the best year ever for heath artillerys in 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 Kent, where I've been working. And I thought, well, that's great, you know, but it's never going to be as good as that again. In twenty twenty one, it's even better. It's thirty percent better. And this is the kind of habitat that the heath artillery likes. It likes these uh, very very hot. Um, very very sunny oak woodlands with uh, with coppice, mostly sweet chestnut coppice, and the food plant is this bright yellow um, common cowwheat. And um, the more common cowwheat you get, um, the better it is for the butterfly. Um, and we've recorded thousands of of heath artilleries just just in Kent um, in the last uh, you know in the last season. Um, just going back to the map, so obviously there, there's only four locations for this butterfly in the whole of the UK, so it's a really restricted species. Interestingly though, common cowwheat is really widespread, so it's clearly, clearly not the food plant which is actually restricting the butterfly, there's something else going on. Um, if it was, you know, if, if it just needed the food plant, then it would be all over the highlands, you know, the butterfly would just be, would be ubiquitous. Sadly, it's just restricted to those small areas. And it's probably the one species that I'm planning to head down south to see um, at the end of June, um, just because it's, um, I've done so much work on it in the last five years, I'm really, really attached to it. And these woodlands are, are lovely places to visit. Uh, another species, and I'd say this is one of my top three butterflies, um, is the 
it's the wood white and I've been focusing on those four coloured dots there in, in the southeast of England um, where we've got this one isolated colony which is uh, moving through a variety of woodlands and um, there's currently a project running there which which, um, which we set up um, for saving saving that population. Um, if you've not seen um, the, the the wood white in flight it's really really is a lovely charismatic little butterfly it's not like the other whites even though the picture looks very similar it's got this very very kind of very light dainty flight and flies just above the grasses and it's almost like it can only just get off the ground and it can only just stay airborne and it's it's just a really really lovely charismatic butterfly and the glanville fertility so the glanville fertility is restricted just to um just to the isle of wight although um there are occasional sightings there have been occasional sightings in, in other locations but but it's just found on the south coast of the isle of wight um on the um on the sort of coastal edge where the where erosion occurs and keeps creating new habitat for it um, um when the when the UK BMS results were announced and were were publicised in, in the national press recently, I, I saw this, which which I thought was typical of the Guardian to kind of jumble up its facts slightly. Glanville Fertility, Scotland is bucking the trend for long term decline. So I guess that's true. Um, the the Glanville Fertility hasn't hasn't declined in Scotland. It's always been at zero. So um, well done, the Guardian, for for slightly jumbling up their their facts there. But one of the other key headline um, species for them was the was the heath fertility, which has done so well. And even really ubiquitous species that we just see all over the place in in southeast England, things like the marbled white. Um, you know, it's another another species I'm I'm not going to see, um, not going to see this season. <clears throat> um, a rare moth that we've been working on um, down in. Uh, down in the southeast is the Sussex Emerald. This feeds on uh, on shingle, uh, vegetated shingle, and uh, its food plant is wild carrot, which glow, grows in, in these kind of areas. And it's got that lovely, uh, obviously a lovely, big, uh, sort of nice green moth, um, but having that really nice cream and red checkered border is, is really special. And um, so this is the distribution map for the Sussex Emerald. Um, so Sussex Emerald, this is Sussex, where the arrow is. Uh, that's my home county. That's where I, I've, I grew up and, um, you know, I feel very attached to Sussex. The quirk is that the Sussex Emerald doesn't occur in Sussex, it occurs in Kent. Um, so a, a bit of a, you know, bit of a point of frustration there for, for Sussex residents and for the uh, Sussex branch of butterfly conservation and for Sussex moth group. Um, we think the, the moth has just colonised a site in uh, a Sussex Wildlife Trust site in Sussex so it is potentially it's just it's just coming home. But of course um, uh, Kent doesn't get the last laugh here because of the Kentish glory. So obviously Kent right down there in the southern tip and that's where the Kentish glory is um, and I've been involved with the um, the RSPB led Kentish glory survey in, uh, in recent years I did some some of the pheromone trap uh, sort of luring in uh, in Carbon Forest which was fantastic and within within a few minutes of putting out the lure um, these fantastic huge moths were come uh, coming crashing in it really was really was exciting um, another another poorly named species, um, the new, uh, new forest burnet. So I've done lots of work in the last seven years working in the new forest. I've never seen new forest burnet, obviously, because it's up here. Um, and so it's a moth I'd love to see. I'll probably have to speak with with Tom about maybe getting to visit visit uh, that that site. Uh, another interesting one, argent and sable. Uh, there's probably two or three woods in southeast England where apparently Argent and Sable lives. Um, I've not seen it. Um, I've not been able to get to those woods at the right time and, uh, and look for it. But again, looking at the dis distribution map, now I'm in exactly the right place for it. 
So I'm really hoping to see this uh, this moth. It really is a really is a stunner. Um, another another interesting one: small pearl bordered fritillary. So you, you can see from the distribution map there that down in southeast England, we've just got one location for it. That's the Butterfly Conservation's Reserve at Rowland Wood in, in Sussex. And the butterfly actually died out there um, about 10 years ago, and it's been reintroduced. And we're, the, what we're doing there, uh, primarily the volunteers working on that reserve, they're really gardening for this species. They're really trying to get the habitat just right, but it's really difficult to just hang on to it there. And it's just disappeared from, from the southeast of England. Um, in a really dramatic way, really, really quickly. And the habitat in a lot of these woods looks, looks perfect and the, the management hasn't changed, but the, the butterfly is just disappearing. So it seems to be a real, you know, there's something else going on here, very, very, you know, it's likely a climate change issue that we're just not going to be able to hang on to it. Um, and it's hanging on by its fingertips in, in Roland Wood down there in the Sussex. But obviously up here, um, it's really, really widely distributed and in the West. Um, <clears throat> you might have attended the, the um, recorders gathering uh, recently where um, Mark Botham was presenting the UK BMS results and he showed this um, big de decline. Uh, stats for Great Britain show long-term decline there. And although it's relatively stable at the moment, it, it is still struggling. But the data for Scotland shows that it's actually increasing and in the last five six years it has actually increased really well so um so there's a really good chance of uh, enjoying it up here whereas down south in the southeast you're just not not going to find the butterfly anymore you know despite what we what we try and do for it another one is the wall um i've been doing lots of work with with bob Ead, who took this photograph on the uh working uh on the South Downs, and we've seen caterpillars uh, just this spring. So um, we're working on a really nice site there. But again, looking at the UK BMS data in England, the decline has just been horrendous in, in um, um, for, you know, for, for a long period of time. And it's just really retreated from all of those inland sites to, um, to coastal areas. And um, it seems to be doing quite well on some of those coastal areas, but, um, but most of those dots inland now um, have gone. And then again, in Scotland, it's doing astronomically well. And last year was the best year on record. Um, so this seems to be, although it's not a species of the Highland branch, as far as I know yet, it does seem to be doing really well. Um, data suggests that um, since this map was produced in 2014, it's jumped the, the, the first fourth, um, it's gone up past St Andrews and Dundee and is heading up towards um, Aberdeen, following the coast up there. Um, I haven't seen data for um, the last couple of years, but it does seem to be moving up those, those coasts. So it could be arriving in the, in, in the highlands and islands. So for me, so now I'm, I'm up in Inverness, um, and this is kind of where I need your help really, because um, now I need to kind of think, well, what, what should I do up here? What, what can I, you know, what can I contribute and how can I get involved and, and what species can I see? Um, so I really, um, really, you know, really encourage you to get involved uh, or get in contact with me rather. Um, here's my garden up in Inverness. Um, so I'm maintaining a nature garden. Um, my next door neighbour's garden is a, is mown to within an inch of its life every every two weeks, um, and I'm trying to maybe influence him. But I'm hoping to encourage lots more species in, in, into the garden here. So while I'm while I'm here and until my money runs out, I'm, I can uh, at, least, at least maintain the garden. So what would I be doing down south at this time of year? I'd be looking for barred two stripe moth um, down on, right down on the south coast. This is um, a site just, just down the road from where I was living, um, 10 minutes walk from, from my house. Um, and the barred two stripe um, lives on the, uh, on the this very low growing privet right on, right on the coastal cliffs. So we'd be out with torches at this time of the year. Um, as soon as the sky gets dark, you, the, the, the moths start to crawl up this, the stems of the privet and, um, and 
you can you can literally you know spot them just with a torch and also there's the pheromone lure uh, which we can use and i tried that again last uh, last year and um sure enough it works so this year obviously i can look for bar two striped up here and that's what i'll be doing in in the coming weeks um up here it seems um as, as Thomas advised, it feeds on ash. Um, so I'll be looking sort of um, down the Great Glen on, on the banks of, of, the, of Loch Ness, um, looking for bar two stripes. Um, <clears throat> and love to get out to places like Glenathwick and see Coitus Diana, um, and certainly come along to the events, um, or the event that that's, uh, the branch is holding there. So I think, Coming to coming to various branch events is really is really going to help me, you know, see lots of new things, see lots of new habitats, lots of new species. So I, I will certainly, you know, get along to um, lots of those, and I'll get to see some of these fantastic species which I wouldn't see down south, and and um, three of these I've never even seen before. So that's going to be a real a real hit for me. I've, I've tried to see checkered skipper three times and and not not found it. Um, down in uh, Lock uh, Arcade, so um, I'm really hoping to see that this year. And this interesting one, so this was one which Tom recommended, um, Ethnia pyrostra, um, which has just been rediscovered um, in the Cairngorms and um, just a, a few very um, obscure locations. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite keen to get out and look for these kind of rare species and something something like this um i suspect well I, I wonder if it's if it's under recorded it says here it feeds on alpine meadow view and when i looked at the bsbi map of alpine meadow view it's right across the highlands so um is you know maybe this is a moth that's under recorded it's, um or maybe it's something like the heath fritillary which um you know, isn't restricted by the abundance of, or the distribution of the food plant. There's something else going on. But I'm very keen to get out and, and get up to um, altitude and, and look for this moth. I also thought, well, I'll, I'll look at the, the uh, fantastic atlas that, the, that was produced and especially look, look at some of those white dots, uh, those sort of blank areas there. I think, I think a few people have actually been out and started to fill these blank areas, uh, they, they, those sort of blank squares. I was looking at this one, NC43, uh, um, which didn't have any records um, when, uh, when the atlas was produced. And you can kind of see why there's, there's almost no infrastructure there. There is that one little, uh, small road that runs up past Loch Meady. So it is actually, you know, it's accessible. So, you know, you can get there. And what I realised was um, seven years ago, I pulled up a side Loch Meady um, in my car and uh, admired the view on my way up to Ben Hope. And um, if I'd managed to find a moth that day, it would have appeared in the atlas and it would have uh, would have contributed there to, uh, um, you know, to the atlas. But again, I'm really keen to get out to places that have been uh, under recorded. I'm also, um, I'm going to be working at least part time over on the Applecross Peninsula. So, um, Really looking to spend spend some time over there. I looked at the uh, um, the BC database before I left, and there's these 16 butterfly species which have been recorded on the Applecross Peninsula um, uh, since 2000. So um, I, I didn't see a lot of records for that area. So I'm again I'm, I'm keen to uh, to try and add add to the add to the data there. So, and this is where I'm actually going to be working at least at least two days a week. Um, this is Apple Cross, and um, I'm working on turning that uh, that Sitka spruce plantation in the middle ground into something a bit more a bit more uh, wildlife friendly, turning it back into a lovely native uh, uh, native woodland. And I'm working with the uh, Apple Cross Community Company on that, on that. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm, I just got started this week, and I'm, you know, really excited about that. Uh, I'm also going to be there for National Moth Night, which everyone 
whichever of those nights um, turns out to be the best weather, I'll, I'll be there and I'll be running a track. The theme this year is woodlands, so I'll be, um, you know, obviously focusing on on that woodland there. I'll probably be sitting about there. If anyone wants to come and join me, you'd be very welcome. So I'll probably try and post progress via my Twitter account. So do feel free to follow that. And um, I'll look at other ways of sharing information with, with the branch and, and with others. Um, do also feel free to contact me if you've got ideas about what I could do or how I can get involved or how I can come and help you. If you um, speak to Pete or to Tom, they can hand over, uh, pass on my contact details. I'm very, very happy to, um, for those to be shared. Um, so I, I hope to hear from you. I hope to see you at some of the events coming up. And um, um, I'm really looking forward to this kind of new, exciting, exciting landscape to just uh, to explore. So thank you for listening. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, yeah, yeah, that was great. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, I like some of your technical bits in there as well. You can obviously do, do more of the presentation than I can. And um, uh, I'll warn you, um, I'm sure at some point uh, Tom will uh, introduce you to the new Forest Burnet site. But if he does, be warned, you'll be uh, collared to do regular monitoring every year from now onwards, um, because we're always a bit short on getting people to go and monitor at the right time of year. So uh, that will be your pay, your, the payback, yeah. You'll get to see New Forest burn it, but you've got to monitor it. Fair enough, um, good deal. Yeah, just got, mentioned a couple of things was, um, uh, you know, you mentioned the decline of some species like small full build of fritillary in, in England, which isn't happening in Scotland. And, um, you know, we do, do see a lot of doom and gloom when we look through uh, butterfly um, uh, publications and um, uh, obviously a lot of those publications are, are written by people in England <laughs> and who are living and in England and so you often do get a lot of doom and gloom uh, about a number of species uh, and here in in Scotland uh, those declines are not usually mirrored uh, we're usually doing okay at least okay for most species um, if not actually seeing good increases um, so you do get a biased opinion of the state of butterflies uh, when you see the UK wide publications um, and, and I'd certainly like to see the I know that like UK BMS will split up their data into the different countries but I'd like to see a lot more uh, data presented for the different countries rather than it all being lumped into a UK average. So, uh, and uh, my other brief comment was uh, with your Ethmia pyrausta. I mean, Alpine Medaru uh, may have looked incredibly widespread on your map, but it is so thinly distributed. I mean, it's, you know, and it's it's really hard to, to find it. Uh, so, it may tick a lot of boxes on the uh, the BSBI atlas, but yeah, if you go out and find, to look for it, it's uh, very difficult to find. Anyway, um, I'm aware that um, partly because I've been blethering on too much at the start, um, that we're running a tad late. Should we, um, should we hold, if you have any questions for Steve, should we hold on to them just now so I can let Aileen crack on um uh, so yes i'll do that so save save any of your questions uh, for a bit later so aileen i'm aware having having given steve a, a a good introduction and then realized he was going to give that introduction himself would you like me to introduce you or would you like to introduce yourself you can introduce me, that's fine. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say that you'd introduce yourself. Anyway, um, okay, so um, Aileen um, uh, was uh, at one time a teacher in primary education, but always had a particular interest in uh, environmental aspects of that. Um, so wanting to spend time in the school garden or out in the forest. Um, 
Uh, Aileen retired early and has been doing a huge amount of work for uh, RSPB in a voluntary capacity. And, um, uh, and I've come across Aileen at the uh, RSPB's Abernethy Reserve, just up the road from me, uh, where she's done a lot of voluntary work. And uh, when you said how many years you've done with RSPB as a volunteer, Aileen, I couldn't believe it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 it's, a lot, it's a lot of years. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so um, uh, Desmond Dugan, uh, an ex-colleague of mine who uh, used to be the uh, senior site manager at Abernethy RSPB Reserve, um, he and Aileen are the driving force behind a... Uh, quite new local charity uh, called Speyside Fields for Wildlife. And anyone that lives in Strathspey um, will come across fields, uh, you'll come across a flowery patch of field, and you'll think, my goodness, that looks amazing. And mm -hmm. that's almost certainly going to be due to the work of Aileen and Desmond. So Aileen, can I hand over to you to explain more? Thank you. Thank you. We'll just uh, see if we can get the technology up. Just need the control. So, sorry? Just hand over the, the right to share screen. Share screen. I think he's done it. So just share. The shares, yeah. Right. Okay. Mark, is that it? Yeah. Yes, that's good, Eileen. Wow. Well, we're here. Um, Thank you. Um, that was a, a wonderful talk, Steve, and uh, I really feel quite enthused about butterflies now, and I always have done, of course, but that was particularly, particularly interesting. Um, yeah, uh, Speyside Fields for Wildlife, I think it was set up around about um, 2017, um, and um, we are, uh, oops, just to hold on a wee sec, I've got to do the same thing on the other side here, just one technical thing here, hold on a wee sec. Um, that's it, good, I'm all set up now. Right, that's Desmond there on the left here. Um, he retired fairly recently and um, he set up this uh, a, organization we we went on a little bit later to become a charity because i recognized that with charitable status we might be able to apply for grants and uh, and we can also claim gift, gift aid so um that's always very useful so um he co-opted myself on very early on and with um, great enthusiasm we set about it and we got jean burns as our treasurer and she She's actually worked for the RSPB as well. Um, but I have to say that our spouses have been a key part of uh, the uh, support group. Um, so I'll look at some of these different things which, which we do as we go along. Um, we're a small, um, a small local charity um, and we got that a charity status in 2018. So you saw just now what, what we do. I, you might wonder why we want to do this. And um, I think everybody here is probably very well aware of the um, massive changes in um, a, our um, landscape over the last 70 years or, or even longer, um, so at least since the Second World War and, and including the Second World War. There's some really interesting book by Ian Newton, Sir Ian Newton, and you probably all have heard of him. He was, I think he was, uh, Pete, was he chair of the uh, RSBB at one time or president or something? He was something, can't remember what. Yeah, Sir Ian Newton. And he's written this amazing book, which is very hard to read. It's very easy to read, but it's, it's, it's um, very depressing. Uh, as well, although he does give you some ideas at the end of it as to what um, what can be done, and I want to just um, I want to just quote from him. Uh, there, none of the rest of the slides, by the way, will be 
all writing, it's all pictures after that. So just bear with me on this one. So Ian Newton says, <clears throat> the insect fauna is enhanced by including plants such as rapeseed, linseed or phacelia that attract pollen and nectar feeding insects. And moreover, biennial crops give a two year break from cultivation, which enables biennial weeds to seed and insect populations to grow. And various small mammals also benefit from the seed crops, especially wood mice. Surveys have confirmed the importance of wild bird seed crops for insects as well as birds. So um, I think you can see from the, this uh, slide that you have here that there has been a big decline in the seed eating bird populations generally over the UK and that modern farming methods have significantly uh, reduced the, the food available to farmland birds. But they've also, it has also upset the um, insect and side, uh, spider populations um, on modern farming, industrialized farming. I probably actually don't need to say too much about that because I suspect that everybody here is really quite well informed on um, the changes in, in farming over the last 70, 80 years. So let's move on. So, <clears throat> um, Just a second, sorry, I've just got to get this one to move on as well. So what do we do? Um, crops for winter bird feeding and summer colour for nectar and pollen. And we have actually more recently moved into trying to create more long-term perennial flowering meadows. And there's a little bit there at the bottom, work with Highland Council. <clears throat> we'll come back to that. We'll just talk about that at the very end. That's maybe more in hope than in expectation, but, but we'll see how, how it goes. So when we are sowing seed for um, wildflower seed in particular, the, the bird uh, crops are quite easy to sow because uh, they're much bit, they're bigger seeds. But wildflower seed is very difficult because it's tiny, really tiny, and you have to um, put a very small amount into a big area. It's amazing how, how well it will um, germinate usually and, and cover it, but it's very small and it does need a lot of training. And this is my uh, granddaughter, she's eight years old and there was another granddaughter, she was five and she was being, she, they were both very good because they, they were children and they were used to listening to instructions <laughs> So they were quite happy that they had to throw the seed up in the air and let the wind catch it and let it fall all around them. And that really worked. And um, people often think, well, we'll just throw it out and, and then you get one line of seed, <laughs> which is not so effective. Um, so um, this, a, this is, a, a, you'll see several pictures a bit like this and you'll get more of an idea. Um, the bird crop is in the background there, that will be fodder, radish um, and um, lots of other things which I'll come back to. And in the foreground there are the cornfield annuals. These are the kind of um, flowers that would have been in um, a corn fields at one time before the use of, of um, herbicides and you, re you never see them now. Um, and I don't think I ever saw them, uh, e even way back in childhood, although I might have and, and, and not noticed, um, uh, as one does in childhood, just take everything for granted. Um, but it's lovely to actually see them now, um, but we don't put them in, in the middle, usually, of the bird crop, but we put them around the edge where they're easier for other people to see. Um, so in amongst that a, a um, flower crop, the annual flower crop, is this plant called Phacelia, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, these, the, the Phacelia is uh, very good because it's um, a member, it's not actually a native, but it is a, a member of the Borage family and it has a very 
easily filled nectary. So it, it's great for bees and it um, is, uh, it, it's really worth having. You should have it in your garden actually. Um, so it's really good. The corn annuals are corn poppies, corn marigold, corn flower, and corn cockle usually, um, and, and sometimes one or two others as well, depends on what's in the seed mix. Um, as I say, it's particularly valuable. It fills up again quickly and, and uh, it, it's um, always covered in, in bees. This is actually Pete's field um, and, um, it, at Lynch, and it had a super early crop of Phacelia before the corn chamomile and the other corn annuals came through. And um, Desmond went down there and he estimated, Pete, I don't know if he told you this, but he, it must have been a really warm sunny day, but he estimated that there were about 10,000 bees in your fields. So we're, we were very pleased with that. Um, I think that, is it underplanted with um, perennial field? Uh, yes, there should be some perennials in there. Yeah, that, so that, that you'll see more of that this year and we're very interesting to see how that develops. So, um, except during the COVID years, we have invited supporters and interested members of the public to come and view some of the crop sites. You can see this is the, the bird crop site. It's um, fodder radish, there's linseed in there, there's quinoa, buckwheat, millet, oats, barley, a good range of bird food crops. Um, and we have always encouraged local people to come and see what's there and uh, they're all, we're us usually well attended. Um, we, initially we have ploughed and sowed each year, but um, recently we've experimented with not planting um, every year, but allowing the seed crop to re-germinate from, from seed that has been dropped. Um, and the advantage of that is that you get more weedy plants coming up, which is good for, for insects. And, and, but you, the disadvantage is you get a slightly lower bird seed crop. So we're learning as we go along and um, we'll, we'll review that experiment annually and just see what we think is the best, the best way forward. It may vary with different sites, of course. Um, this is um, 2017. This is our very first flower field. Um, and it's about half a hectare. Most of our sites are either a hectare or, or an acre. Um, this one was quite small. You can see where it is. It's in Granton and Spain. That's looking at the old bridge there. Um, but it looks quite pretty, but actually it wasn't particularly successful. We weren't very pleased with it in the end because it took so long to get going because it was so heavily browsed by deer. They, they just thought it was fantastic. And I have to say that <clears throat> not all of our sites are successful. Um, and, and is it's quite often due to, to deer pressure. So that's something we have to be aware of and whether um, landowners are, are able to control their deer population. This field is on the outskirts of Nettie Bridge and it's a, a good site to bring our supporters to view and discuss the crops. The um, owner himself is very enthusiastic and he has been a great support and it is a field of bird crop and flower crop. Um, and the main part of this crop also has a, wader, a waders management um, program. So um, that, that's really good. He's very sympathetic to, to wildlife and loves doing this bit as well. And the Cairngorms National Park staff uh, enjoy a day out and um, uh, we are, our supporters are people who who help us either financially or with their time or both, which, which is lovely. And we used to have afternoon tea in the hotel afterwards, but obviously with COVID that's been canceled for the last couple of years. Um, this is a scene from 2021. So that's last summer. 
um, we were able to take the photos out and the CNPA staff. And this is in Talach. And this is um, this is the, the site that you saw being sown by Lucy and myself. Um, so you can see that our flower crop has done very well in, in, in this in this bit. So she she was she was really pleased. <laughs> <clears throat> and then this is actually also in Tullock, and this is the bird, bird flower crop, uh, bird crop. Um, the bare patch in the middle there that you can see um, where we've all been standing is not, not because we've been standing on it actually, but because it was being eaten by the deer. Um, but nevertheless, there was sufficient bird crop and not too much deer damage um, to allow this to be a very successful site. Um, and this year there was quite good sized um, mixed crops of finches uh, using the, the field in the winter time. Of course, any visit to the fields provides an opportunity to get together. And we were lucky that it was a lovely day. And Morag, she's right in, at the back there in the middle. Um, that's Desmond's wife. She really did us proud. We had a wonderful afternoon tea and the sun shone and everybody was really happy. So it was a real feel good experience having, having looked at the um, various crops in Nakedbridge and in Tullet. The baking was five star. Well, the proof of the pudding um, is in the sky this time. And what, what happens? So do we actually get any birds coming? Um, and uh, here you can see a flock of ramblings and chaffinches coming in. Now, um, I hope you can read the uh, print there that this is just, we have bird records and the bird records are kept by, are, are by Desmond and Pete Gordon, who I think is here, um, helps a, a lot by recording birds as well um, for us. So, um, for example, in 2019 in the Musa field, you've got 600 bramblings, um, 300 linnets on a particular day, um, just to move on. 6th of February 2020, a thousand linnets in the Ballymore field. That Ballymore field is in Nettybridge near Gory Castle, uh, Castle Roy, I should say. And um, you, you can see it. It's an easy site to go and see. And we got um, Dunnocks, Chaffinches, Wrens, Pheasants, um, and um, uh, uh, the Bramblings have been quite common this year, actually, there's been quite a lot of Bramblings around, which is lovely. <coughs> Each site varies, but only one site actually didn't pull in good numbers of birds. Um, so we decided, we decided to convert this site to a perennial meadow. And I'll go on and talk about perennial meadows shortly. Um, so just some of Desmond's pictures of, um, of birds that you're likely to see. Um, and you'll know them all. And of course, um, where you get lots of birds, you're going to get the, um, the, the, the birds of prey um, hanging about, <laughs> looking for an easy meal. Um, so another one of Desmond's pictures. All the pictures, I should have labeled them actually, but all the pictures are either Desmond's or mine. And there is one picture, which is Amanda Thompson, who lives in, in Tullock. We'll see that one later. Um, and th um, through our website, we can offer advice to gardeners and we can visit their site. And even our volunteer accountant is on the job and he's a very keen gardener. Um, and this year, uh, he's sown for the last three or four years, he's sown an, an annual meadow and we've, we've given him the seed for it um, as a thank you for managing the accounts. Um, but this year, he told me very proudly that um, he'd actually collected the seed from his own last year's seed. So I hope he stored it well. <laughs> um, and he's going to try growing it from his own seed this year. So that, that, that would be interesting to see if that comes up. Um, so we uh, can offer, we encourage gardeners, we can offer advice um, and sometimes plug plants. I grow quite a few plug plants 
and um, we can uh, also help them with, with seed. Um, this doesn't look like much, and that's the way it should look actually in the first year of uh, establishing a meadow. It should like a, look like a weedy mess. And at the bottom of the garden there, you can see the fence, and just beyond that fence is the Speyside Way. And uh, the owner of this garden, which is a big patch of lawn, huge patch of lawn, um, she wants to convert the whole lot, I think, to um, perennial meadow. And, um, but it's an expensive thing to do because you either have to dig it up, and that's hard, very hard work, you're digging up old turf, or you have to get a digger in, um, and, and, and that costs money. And then the seed costs money as well. So it, it, it's a labor of love and some expense. Working with gardeners, it's often a matter of discussing and managing expectations because um, there's a lot of um, pic pictorial meadows around advertised, which look very pretty, full of um, flowers, which are not necessarily native actually, um, and, and, and look lovely. Um, and they think when they're sowing um, a flower, wildflower meadow seed that they'll, they'll get a lovely scene. And, Really, um, that doesn't work unless you're sowing um, an annual meadow onto um, good quality, fair soil. Um, but if you're establishing a perennial meadow, it needs to be on poor soil, and you can't really expect much in the first year. So um, again, it's a lot of conversations and letting people know that um, things uh, will come, but it takes time. And this um, here is a meadow which was established quite early on. I think it was 2018 it was started. Um, and it's quite a big site. I think it's a, almost a hectare and it's in Neckerbridge. It's surrounded by forest and they do have deer, um, but actually it just seems to be the one uh, a roe deer and she uh, manages to live in this field at springtime and she'll have a calf or two and the field is big enough to be able to cope with it. So that, that's good news. Um, it's quite full of uh, oxide daisy, as you can see at the moment, but uh, that's normal as well in establishing a meadow. You often get one species being strong to start with, and then um, the other species um, will, will uh, get a chance to get going and become more diverse. So this is her meadow again, it's again in the, in the autumn, and um, it's, a, it's the first one, it's, it's hard, you've got to get it cut, she got it cut by machine, which was great, um, but it needed to be raked up, and it was physically very demanding work. Um, Fiona, I think you were there, um, she, Fiona Angie, she, I think you were there and you helped with this raking up. And then we piled it onto a tra tractor's trailer, which was quite a heavy job as well, and uh, got it taken away. But since then, I think uh, the owner has managed to get it done by machine. And then I believe she puts in um, two or three, four sheep just for a very short time um, in the last months of the year. So that would be around about November, November, December. And, uh, and that's fine. This is um, a new site. Um, now the, the, the sheep in this field, the, the, the other field, um, don't belong to this owner. He doesn't have any stock at all, um, but it's in the sky car and it's a, quite a big site. And he wants to convert it to a uh, flowering meadow. And he's also having, um, planting a deciduous woodland and hoping to have uh, woodland flowers. Um, established in, in that woodland meadow. Um, but the main meadow is the bit that he started on at the moment. Um, we, we examined the field first, which showed um, very little plant diversity, although quite a lot of dockins um, and, and uh, uh, some thistles as well. I think it's important to say that when we look at a, a site, if somebody comes, us to ask, comes and asks us, uh, when you look at this site, do you think it's suitable? If it's already got quite a lot of um, variety in it, we wouldn't 
recommend ploughing it up and re-sowing it. We would recommend a management uh, system to help to improve the diversity um, and give the plants a chance to, to multiply and get going. Introducing yellow rattle seed, for example, if it's not there and um, cutting uh, in the autumn, raking off the cuttings and uh, making sure that uh, it's done fertilised because it needs to be for so long. Um, and uh, some people will want to graze it and you can graze. Oh, yeah. The field in Sky of Kerr, yeah? Yes, Sky of Kerr. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, there we are. Oh. Where we are. Um, and now this was, <laughs> I think that that field was very fertile. The soil was very fertile. And, we, and uh, it was sown with um, a perennial meadow. And then it was over sown um, because the, the conditions were so poor for germination last year. Um, it was so cold and wet in May that it had been sown then that, that the owner, I think, was a bit worried about the it actually germinating coming through. So he, he actually sowed some uh, annual meadow on, on top of it, uh, on, on some of it, and, and that came through very well. But as you can see, this is actually quite lush, but I was quite pleased to see that the, that the white campion actually managed to flower. Um, uh, but there were a lot of dockins in it and um, he's uh, not keen to use herbicides and that's wonderful, but it does mean uh, having to take the dockings out or keep them down yourself. So a lot of hard work. And of course, there was a lot of hard work for us in the autumn because we needed to, to help them rake it all up and, um, uh, and uh, prepare it for, for next year. We're hoping, I'm hoping you'll consider using machinery. It actually cuts this field with, um, uh, what do you call it, a scythe. Most of it with a scythe and some of it with a strimmer, so it's huge. Um, so the Cairngorms National Park uh, volunteers came out and helped us um, on that particular day. And um, we have to say a big thank you to Cairngorms National Park. We have a really good relationship with them. Um, they help us financially. They give us practical help. And these are people there. Some of them are um, on the, uh, uh, from Cairngorms National Park volunteers. They can be a source of advice and um, and uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Watts from the National Park is spearheading with me the partnership in the Verges project which will come to a little bit. Um, so this uh, field, this is a relatively new site and it's had um, two years of bird um, crop and wildflower mix um, fodder, radish, kale, corn annuals, corn marigold tends to predominate, as you can see in the summer months. Um, corn poppy seed, interestingly, prefers to have overwintered. So we don't tend to get very much of corn poppy because we usually sow the corn annuals in the spring. Um, this, uh, the owner for this site, which is not too far from the Sky of Kerr site, uh, wants to convert this to perennial meadow. So we've actually got three sites now within a very short distance of each other, two in Sky of Kerr and one um, just uh, close to, very close to Sky of Kerr. And they're both quite good, they're all quite good size. They're all either um, half a hectare or a hectare or, or close to a hectare in size that would be converted to perennial meadow. This one is particularly good because it's got, you can't see this at it, but it's got boggy areas nearby and pools. And so there's a huge diversity of insect life, um, huge diversity of life altogether, uh, wildlife in, in that area. It's got the woodland as well. One of its problems is the deer. We might have to manage the deer. Right, what was happening here is that um, at Castle Roy, we were asked, uh, if you haven't been to Castle Roy recently, I, I suggest it might be a nice visit because um, it's been renovated and Richard Eccles has done a great job. Um, and he's asked us in to help him with um, what can we do for wildlife. So it, it's an it's a, a nice pudding. Sorry. Huh? Sorry. 
Oh, right. Okay. Um, it's a site that's um, going to be used probably for um, wedding parties and so on. So there'll be lots of different people coming to see it. So we've got some areas in there which we've just sown for um, wildflower meadow. Interestingly enough, we had two different varieties of seed, um, two different sources. One came up beautifully, absolutely beautifully. We sowed it in late August. By mid-September, it was quite well up. And the other one hasn't germinated yet. I, I've a feeling it probably won't. We may have to re-sow that one. Um, and of course, you've got to have uh, coffee time. <laughs> and that's one of the things that we really enjoy, just uh, getting a little break and a bit of a chat and homemade biscuits. So, um, and ultimately, a meadow will improve biodiversity, we think. And these are just two slides here. Uh, some samples taken from my own perennial meadow area, or in the case of, I believe that's a parabola of fertility. And I, I hate to say it to such experts here, but maybe someone could confirm that or not. That was actually taken on one of my neighbor's perennial meadow lawns, which she's establishing as well. And um, there's an exciting and wide variety of invertebrates. Uh, I don't know if you, I hope you can see it. You might need to move your, the people, but I hope you can see this um, Tahina Grosso up in the top right hand side. Uh, I think Fiona, I think you identified that for me, uh, Fiona Ongi. It's yes, a, I did. You did. It, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's that. Yeah, oh, it is. It's an absolutely wonderful beastie, and um, I've seen it each year now because I look out for it. <laughs> you can't miss it once you've got it. I think I should get a big photograph and have it up in the house. Um, so lots of exciting things. Um, and um, obviously we have to raise money, so we get money from grants. We've, uh, we've got a grant from the Nature Restoration Fund um, to help with the two new meadows that we're establishing this year. They're quite big sites. Um, and we had a, um, we had a, we have grants from the, the National Park. Um, and we do some fundraising. So this is one of our plant sales and um, it was quite a lot of fun. We had uh, some musicians up on the balcony uh, playing music, but I should have asked them to play Percy Grangers in an English country garden, um, but I'm afraid uh, we didn't, <laughs> but we should have had that. So um, the Verges project, this is the last slide virtually. Um, just to see that we, it, it's more in hope than expectations. So don't get too excited about it. But ultimately, I'm sure all of us would like to see Highland Council adopt a wildlife friendly policy to managing road verges and public spaces. Um, so we've identified two areas for management by ourselves. Um, and that is uh, management is not cutting until late August breaking off the cuttings and if we can introducing some yellow rattle uh, possibly possibly increasing the flower range with, with the native local plug plants and if we can get the go ahead Desmond will make signs similar to the one that you're seeing here which is obviously Perth and Can Ross Council um, so that when the cutter comes round he sees this bit he thinks oh no I better not cut here and he comes in July I'm sure you remember the first COVID year, nothing got cut. And we were really amazed at, at, at the, the lovely flowers on, in Tullaf in um, uh, one of the areas. Uh, and then of course, uh, the following year, it was, it was cut just while it was in the best of flowering. So we'd like to see some changes with that. We're using it as a pilot project. If it gets to go ahead, they've still got to do an assessment. The roads department is still to do an assessment. There's money there from Nature Restoration. They've, they've signed off on it as long as the roads department can get, get themselves organised. But as I say, we'll just wait and see what happens. We'll take photographs of before and after, and hopefully we might be able to do an invertebrate count. Um, and we've got a comparative area that we could use as well, which, which will not be managed by us, but is just up the road from, from the bit we want to manage. So it'll be very similar. Um, and maybe with that, 
evidence and all the other evidence that's accumulating, the council will um, consider some changes. So um, thank you for listening and um, hopefully uh, that has been of some interest to you. Sorry, there's not many butterflies in it. Okay, thank you very much, Aileen. Very interesting. Um, can you um, say how you go about finding your sites? Are you proactively approaching people or do you just have people come to you? Uh, people have always come to us. Um, although Desmond, a, people have mostly come to us, although I think Desmond himself, he should, he should probably be answering this question, has approached one or two farmers. And um, one of our first sites uh, was um, a, a very good farmer who um, was working well with us. And it was a space side fields for wildlife along the space side, uh, space side route. Um, but uh, unfortunately he died and, and uh, who it's been passed on to is not, is not interested. I think what Desmond would say is people who are working with us have to really want to do it it's not just about the money um because we we will um offset uh the cost for a farmer if he's losing income from using the field for bird crops or or um, flowers it needs to be offset uh in some financial way so that's where we come in and we also come in and what, what we suggest is, is planted and so on um, but um, a lot of the people who, who come to us have come through um, the website or directly to Desmond or myself because um, they've seen information, a lot of information went out on Autumn Watch um, and we had a lot of inquiries after that. Okay, um, <clears throat> it would be uh, good to see more kind of um, butterfly monitoring or butterfly records from some of your sites. Um, I know, uh, you know, folk like Pete are, are obviously recording birds. Um, it, yeah, has anyone attempted any kind of, no. any kind of systematic <laughs> butterfly monitoring at all? No, we haven't done any um, invertebrate monitoring at all. Um, there's something which, yes, it would be a good idea to do. There, the, there's just only so much one can do, but yes, it would be a good idea. Yeah, okay. And um, yeah, I was pleased you mentioning uh, a kind of a move to creating more perennial meadows. Uh, I mean, these do uh, kind of reduce the workload a bit if you can get them established. Uh, mm -hmm. and be kind of self-maintaining. And the perennial meadows will, I'm guessing, be much better for all stages of the life cycle for butterflies and moths. Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously your very, very flowery uh, sort of annual meadows are great for providing nectar, mm -hmm. um, but it's the perennial meadows that would provide uh, food plants for caterpillars to feed on yeah. uh, and uh, kind of sustain a butterfly population and moth population rather than just producing a load of, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. of uh, nectar. So that, yeah. that, that would be good. <clears throat> We're very aware of that. Um, and trying to get birds cooked while in there, trying to get as wide a variety of diversity of plants as possible so that um, there's a bigger diversity of uh, invertebrates. Yes. Um, uh, there was a question asked by Susan about um, the risk of uh, introducing um, non-native species uh, into the field. So, for example, Phacelia, um is very widely um, grown in crops for uh, which is because it's such a good plant for bees, isn't it? Yeah. Um, do, how do you go about choosing your uh, plant species? Um, for the perennial meadows, um, I, we would choose uh, an, only a native, a British native um, a seed source. Um, 
not necessarily a Scottish native source because the only suppliers are actually Scotia seeds and they're extremely expensive. Um, so we have gone with a, a, a company called Naturescape, for example, um, who can provide British grown uh, seed um, for, for, for the perennial meadows. The, um, the cilia, <coughs> um, it doesn't seem to um, grow anywhere else. Um, it doesn't seem to get into the, um, the, the, field, the field edges or anything because it's obviously a plant that likes to grow on bare soil. So it's not become a problem uh, outside of where it's meant to be, where we put it. Okay. Um, Aileen, would you like to stop sharing your screen? Yeah, I'm uh, just looking to see what I can, how I do that. I've got my husband here now. Stop share. Oh, I've got it now. Yeah. There you go. Right, Keith, good. Keith, Keith's the uh, techie guru, obviously. He's the like <laughs> guru, yeah. Uh, okay, I appreciate we're running uh, a bit late, but uh, there was one one question that Fiona asked earlier, this, I'll maybe throw this to Steve because it's a really tough question, Steve. Um, Fiona was asking why, why are there butterfly and moth species with a disjunct distribution within the UK? So you'll find something that's in, for example, the northwest of mm. Scotland and then the southeast of England and nowhere in between. And I know this crops up with a number of species. Have you any any theories as to why that mm, might be? No, I saw that question as well, and I was scratching my head. <laughs> I'd have to throw it to the person that works for butterfly conservation, which is Tom. <laughs> yeah, to, to, Tom is bound to know. <laughs> well, I, I don't really know, but, but I think something like New Forest Burnet, I suspect that it probably survived uh, the Ice Age, you know, up on the uh, somewhere on the northwest where it was a little bit milder. And then, uh, you know, when the uh, when England was joined to the continent, there was probably, you know, another population probably came in. And I think we're so lucky in Scotland that because we have, uh, you know, wonderful landscapes with uh, habitats that are connected, things survive up here far better than they do down south. And I think it's and something like Kentish Glory I mean, I suspect Kentish glory, you know, hundreds of years ago was probably widespread throughout uh, Britain. And uh, it just so happens that our forestry management and our huge landscapes with lots of birch, it's managed to survive and it's just been lost further south. OK, thank you for that, Tom. Uh, thank well. you very much. Yeah. OK, folks, uh, thank you very much, Steve, and thank you very much, Aileen. Um, I have to say that uh, when you drive around the Nephew Bridge area in the summer, it's just so wonderful to uh, come across these fields full of colourful flowers. It's, it's, it's really uplifting. And uh, good luck with your Verges campaign. Uh, <laughs> that's something that many people have been tearing their hair out about for ages. And uh, yeah, Hillary has just informed me that She's seen the council out already cutting verges. Well, nothing's grown yet. It's absolute, you know, it's such a waste of, um, you know, it's a waste of taxpayers' money. It's a waste of diesel. Um, uh, and and it, 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 it achieves absolutely nothing for much of the verges that they cut. Yeah. So um, it's absolutely infuriating. And uh, yeah, we'd like to see those sort of campaigns happening up here. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so, let... uh, Pete, uh, just to say that um, I've got guests, so I'm going to, to leave now and I'll maybe catch up with the rest of your meeting um, from, from your website later. Okay. Right. Thank you very much, Amy. Yeah. Thanks. Good luck with your guests. Thank okay. You. Cheers. Bye. Okay, folks, should we take a, a 10 minute break, grab a quick cup of tea and have a wee, uh, and then uh, come back uh, for Tom and Jeff? Okay, see you in about 10 minutes. So, Pete, Gordon, um, I hope it was interesting to hear that you've done a bit of moth trapping near Castle Roy. Um, De Desmond tried 
was encouraging me to moth trap in uh, the, uh, the the meadow we did down at Inch, but it was just too far away for me to do it. I tried tried to get a couple of my volunteers to run a trap in it, but no one did in the end. So um, I'm sure they must be brilliant places. Um, you know, with all that nectar, must pull in a lot of moths at night. Yeah, I've only done it on an ad hoc basis, really, for a couple of nights per season. Um, fortunately, there is mains electricity there, which helps a lot. Uh, and I will try to do a bit more, but uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing it anyway in a systematic man manner that would really tell us very much, other than perhaps to say, well, these species occur here, and these happen to the numbers I caught on those nights. Yeah, yeah. Have you managed to get your trap running in the garden this spring? I haven't run it once this spring. I'm <laughs> going away next week for a long holiday, so uh, my list will be rather low this year, I'm afraid. <laughs> so, I'll see things in Spain, though. So you're off in the camper van? Off in the camper van, end of next week. Yeah. So destinations? Uh, north of Spain to the south of Spain and back to the north of Spain, four to six weeks. Oh. Brilliant. Oh. Yeah. All right. Brilliant. For, all right for you, retired people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think I don't think it, think of all that um, all that petrol you'll be using up. The you'll be you're ruining the planet. I think you've just got to stay in Nethy Bridge. Yes, but my argument would be if I'm going from the north of Spain to the south of Spain and back again, the more days I take over it, the less fuel I'll be using per day. I won't <laughs> down to, to inch every day, for instance. <laughs> yes, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well done, Pete. Can't argue with that logic. <laughs> <laughs> Says someone who loves to jet all over the world on, <laughs> on these holidays. Another one yeah. ruining the planet. <laughs> what? Oops. What? What can I say? <laughs> guilty, guilty is charged. <laughs> yeah. The only the only reason I'm not jetting all over the world ruining the planet is because I can't afford it. <laughs> Otherwise, I would be. Right, a lot of faces seem to be appearing. Shall we, we've had our 10 minutes, shall we crack on? Um, in which case I shall now hand you over to Tom, who, <laughs> when we planned this, we were going to have a, a live moths session and uh, Tom was going to show you all the many, many species of moths he'd caught in his trap last night. However, <laughs> do you, how many live moths do you have, Tom? Yes, it's, uh, we can't call it live moths, but uh, we could call it live uh, moth. I have uh, <laughs> one species of moth in a tub here that... Uh, I, yeah, I might try and show you, but it's easier to show on my phone, so I might have to uh, disconnect from this and uh, reconnect with my phone. But uh, you can all try and guess what that moth is. Um, I, but yeah, so perhaps at the end, you can all uh, try and guess what it is. Um, but what I have done, knowing that the forecast was so poor, is that I've, uh, I've pinged an email to all our wonderful uh, Vice County Butterfly and Moth Recorders, and uh, they've all got back to me with um, yes, yeah, some some of the news, some of the things that people have been seeing, or perhaps some of the things that people haven't been seeing. So what I'll do is that uh, a, a number of them sent me some nice photographs. So I will uh, do a quick sort of slideshow of uh, what people have been seeing. Um, and I must admit that I've had a very poor season so far and hardly seen anything. So if I just quickly try and uh, share my screen, hopefully you can all see that if I click the right button. Come on. 
there we go. So this is what's become a very, very famous photograph from a spring special event that uh, I ran down at Newton Moor, oh, I don't know, maybe 12 or 15 years ago. Um, it was held in the middle of April, so obviously at the same time of year. And it's just to show, obviously, we all know living in the Highlands that, uh, yes, snow is far more likely at Easter than it is uh, in, the, in the winter. Um, so yes, although we complain about the conditions, sadly, they're not unusual and spring is always a very long time in coming. So as you all know, so far this year, we had an absolutely amazing weather at the end of March. You know, the last, what, week or 10 days of March was superb. A number of butterflies were seen. Um, but really since then, yes, winter has returned. And I had a number of comments when I sent my email out, particularly from the moth recorders. Um, people saying like Neil up in Caithness, it's been pretty dismal weather for mothing so far, either too wet, too windy or too wet and windy. Um, I think I would add to that also cold um, and also that it doesn't look great for the next few days either. John Kemp out on Uist said it's, uh, it's pretty grim here at present with little happening. Uh, we had a small flurry of activity three weeks ago, but it's now gone very quiet. Uh, Graham, who I know here is today up in uh, Sutherland, said it's been too cool at night to get much airborne. I would certainly agree with that. And Mary in Easter Ross has just simply said it's rubbish weather for moths at the moment, but March was much better. So I think that, uh, yeah, that, that sums it up. So I'll quickly whiz through uh, some slides, some nice photos that folk have sent, starting with the butterflies. And yes, we mentioned Comma before. So Comma has been seen this year. This is Stuart, Stuart Taylor from Metnethy Bridge. He gets a comma in his garden almost every spring. And this was seen on the 26th of March. And it's his, first, it's his earliest record of, of comma from his garden. It's uh, overwintered as an adult. And I think we should make the 26th of March uh, National Comma Day in the Highlands because on that day, there were three other commas seen in the area. So one was seen on for at Forest, one at Logie Steadings, and one uh, in Bampshire at Cullen. So it's good to know that folk have been, or a few folk have been seen comma. Um, Obviously, small tortoise shells and uh, peacocks have abound. Um, I've had more reports of peacocks than small tortoise shells. Um, also, a few red admirals around um, up in Sutherland and in Fort William and a few elsewhere. Um, and the only other species that I'm aware of that's been seen so far is uh, small white. And this was from Margaret, uh, Margaret Curry. Um, on the, in Easter Ross at Kolboki. And this was a small white that emerged from its chrysalis. You can see the chrysalis in the background there uh, from that was uh, that overwintered in the chrysalis in, on the side of her conservatory. And this emerged on the 2nd of April, um, only for it to snow the next day. Um, I've got a similar chrysalis on the, the side of my house that I keep checking, but yes, it's still very, very much uh, uh, still in its chrysalis, refusing to, uh, to emerge quite rightly. So they're the only species of butterfly that I'm aware of that have been seen so far in, uh, in the highlands. I know elsewhere that, um, you know, there has been uh, orange tips have been seen, and I think green hair streak, but as far as I'm aware, not yet in highland. So let's move over to the moths. And I think this is a fairly uh, typical uh, scene of trying to moth certainly over the last few weeks. This is from Peter Hall, who uh, very like um, Steve, has just uh, emigrated north of the border. I'm not quite sure where you came from, Peter. I think it was Gloucestershire, but Peter now lives uh, near Rosemarkey. And this was a trap that he ran on the 4th of April. And you can see there, despite the snow, there's actually some moths there. And he recorded 56 moths of eight species in this trap. So you can see how hardy our highland moths are. You certainly wouldn't get this uh, down south. 
Um, one of their classic early species is uh, the wonderful Rannock Sprawler associated with our uh, mature birch woodlands. Uh, this is one that was uh, recorded from Eregi on the 27th of March, and it was a, a first for the, uh, that particular 10 kilometer square. Uh, Mike Taylor is always the man that catches lots of uh, sprawlers, uh, Rannock sprawlers at his house. He had a maximum of 16 on the 22nd of March, and he reckons that the flight period was a wee bit later this year because of the lateness of the spring than usual. Hopefully there's still a few on the wing for folk to see. Uh, I've not managed to catch up with one yet so far this year. Uh, another common uh, but early spring species is the wonderful yellow horned. This seems to be having a really good year with the very first record uh, on Lewis for the um, Outer Hebrides on the 19th of March by Debbie Storrow, uh, to be followed a week later on the 26th of March by the second ever record on South Uist. Um, they also having a good year in Sutherland where uh, Graham Thompson had one at Strathhalladale, and that is the first one to be found that far north, sort of away from the coast. Um, Mike caught this really striking version of yellow horned in his garden. Um, you know, it just shows that we do get different forms in Scotland, but I've never seen one quite as bizarrely marked as this. So a, a really nice, really uh, wonderful uh, yellow horned. And obviously we, and some of our other common spring species, we have different forms in, in Scotland. So th this is the form of Hebrew character, where the Hebrew character in the center of the wing is brown rather than the, the classic black. And this is uh, another one of Peter's uh, from Rose Markey, but, but quite a sort of, a, well, a, a fairly common form that we get. I don't know about maybe sort of 5% of our uh, Hebrew characters are like this. A species that's uh, moving north into our area and continues to do so is pale uh, pinion. The photo on the left is from Wester Ross, which was the first record for VC 105. The one on the right is uh, another of Peter's ones from Rose Markey. Uh, there are only five records up to in uh, Easter Ross up to 2018, and there's been three so far this year. Mary had a couple in Dingwall and this one from Rose Markey, so it's still continuing to spread. Um, a wonderful pine beauty. I would say that's out quite early. This is from Skerre from in North Sutherland, seen on the, what to me is a very early date of the 24th of March. Uh, a wonderful male uh, oak beauty with a really nice feathery antennae. Obviously seen better days, its wings are a wee bit tatty. This comes from Gerlock and is the first for, uh, sorry, no, sorry, the second record for um, Westeros. Uh, the first one being just the previous year in 2021. And a really nice, fresh mottled grey. Another male, I don't know whether you can just make out the very feathery antennae. This is from, uh, from Faye um, in uh, Doorknock. Um, and when she put out the, the trap she had uh, on this particular day, there were five other species, red strawed grass, Hebrew character, yellow horned, common Quaker and engrailed, just to give you an idea of uh, you know, some of the other species that are on the wing. And another of Peter's from Rose Markey, um, early tooth striped, uh, fairly similar to the previous mottled gray, but, but the wings are, are much sort of uh, wider and broader and almost sort of come to a sort of rounded tip. And what I really, really like about this photograph is the snowflakes that you can see on the back of the trap in the, in the background. Again, just to prove how tough our uh, highland moths are, you wouldn't get this down south. Um, a fairly unusual species, I, I don't see many of these, uh, and Mike commented the same, this is Mike Taylor's, a shoulder stripe that he uh, recorded in Broader on the 28th of March. And now to uh, belted Beauty. Uh, this is from John Kemp uh, on South Uist, where from the, they were first seen on the 26th of March and they've so far recorded 26. Um, and as always with, uh, with uh, Belted Beauty and Rannoch Brindled Beauty, 
uh, the best way to record them is by looking on fence posts. And this is one of those species where the female on the right um, is just like a spore and it, it's wingless. And you can see these uh, lovely stripes on the, uh, on the abdomen of the body. So this is uh, belted beauty, which is very much, most, much a sort of maca species. Uh, there's only one site on mainland Scotland at Ardna Merkin. Uh, but it, it's relatively widespread on, uh, yeah, on the Outer Isles. And this is its more sort of inland cousin, the Rannoch Brindle Beauty, uh, which has a very similar <coughs> flightless female. These are the males. And again, you can see uh, how well camouflaged they are on fence posts, particularly these really nice uh, lichen encrusted fence posts. And it's been a really, really good year for them. Um, Mary uh, at Kilboki was saying that when she was the vice county recorder for Easter Ross up until 2010, it was only really known from one site around Oikel Bridge. But now um, it is far more widespread and she reckons in the right habitat, it's almost found on every other fence post. So this year already, Mayor Margaret and Andy recorded uh, 24 males and 20 females up Strathrory and four males and six females up Strathvake. Uh, it's been found for the first time in Strathconnan by Ewan Munro and Mary found it at Little Wivis, which is again, another new site. Um, also here in Badenoch and Strathspey, it's um, the number of records from places like Delbog, Cat Lodge, Glen Banker, uh, where 16 were, were seen at, in total in those locations. And I know Ian Leach uh, from Newton Stewart was up looking for Rannoch Sprawler and Rannoch Brindle Beauty in March, and he also recorded 16 so, um, here and in, uh, and in the Rannoch area. So uh, yeah, it seems to be having a really good year. Um, so yeah, get out there and look on these fence posts for the, the wonderful males and the flightless females. This is sword grass, um, the scarcer cousin of the red sword grass. Um, Peter had one in Rosemarkey, but this one actually comes from Orkney. Uh, this is from Alastair Forsyth in Doonby, who recorded this on the 28th of March. Um, the pattern on the, the wing is slightly different compared to red sword grass, but the other characteristic are the paler legs, which sword grass has and red sword grass doesn't. Now, what's interesting with this is that this particular specimen was attracted to a leek moth pheromone. Now, leek moth is a pest of leeks uh, down south. It's a very scarce moth in, uh, in Scotland. Uh, looking at the maps, uh, there's only uh, occurs in East Lothian and in Dumfrieshire. So I don't know whether Alistair was uh, concerned that his leeks were being uh, about to be plagued by leek moth and was wondering whether you know they might be there or whether for some reason he knew that uh, perhaps uh, you know sword grass and other moths might be attracted to their pheromone um, so it may be worth getting some leek moth pheromones which are easily available online and seeing whether others can attract um, sword grass. It does come to light, but my experience is that you record them far uh, in far greater numbers and far more regularity if you put out sugar or wine ropes. So yes, go out and get your leek moth pheromones. Quickly, a few uh, micros. This is a brindle pug from Sutherland. Uh, they overwinter as adults. Uh, this is a what I think is a wonderful photograph of 20 plume moth. Uh, from Kate Ness, seen on the 26th of March. Uh, light brown apple moth, which is a real pest and, and comes in huge numbers down south. I'm yet to see one in Scotland. Uh, this one was found on South Uist, the second record for the Outer Isles by Bill Neal. And a nice oak nyctaline, a slightly funny form. I mean, it is very, very variable, uh, caught by Mary near Dingwall. And what about this? Um, if I was sent this photograph, I would go straight to the moth books and sort of pour over them, wondering what it was. And of course, I wouldn't find it because it is actually a uh, caddis fly. Uh, so this is the yellow spotted sedge 
uh, found by Graham, Graham Crittenden in Strath Halladale on the 26th of March. And finally, to show that spring is not far away, um, uh, these are the eggs from a female emperor moth uh, that laid uh, on the egg boxes in Graham's trap, um, uh, probably at the end of March. So it's always a sign, a, a lovely spring moth and a sign that yes, uh, yes, yeah, spring is just around the corner. So that was a very much a whiz through uh, the highlights or some of the news that uh, has been sent in to me. Um, now, out of all those moths I mentioned, my moth that I have in front of me, I didn't name. So uh, feel free to shout out what moth you think it might be. Can we see it? Well, you could sort of see it. The trouble is, is that I've got this funny background that it... Uh, <laughs> Surely you can identify it from that, Audrey. Yeah, of course we can. I, <laughs> it, it's really clear. I would say, clear. if it was in my garden, the most likely thing would probably be Hebrew character. Oh, well, I've not mentioned it in my talk, so I did mention Hebrew character. Oh, oh there you go. You can see the under, you can see it's a female. Oh, lovely. And these ones overwinter and come out. It's only the females, I think, that come out. It's a noctuid. A green carpet. Yeah. That's no, it is drum roll, brindled ochre. Uh -huh. I would never have got that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for making it difficult, everyone. <laughs> that was brilliant. Thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, it's great to know that there are moths out there, even though I have hardly seen any myself, uh, apart from in my living room. And um, uh, I, I can, I'm always amazed by um, folk that run traps, like you saw Peter's trap there covered in snow and he still had a load of moths in it. Whenever I trap on nights like that, I never get anything. So I don't know, it's a, it must be something I'm doing wrong. Um, anyway, that was brilliant. And definitely uh, inspired, seeing some, Good photographs of moths that are on the wing now, or were, were in March at least. Uh, it's definitely inspiring to uh, get out there and get going. Um, anyone got any quick questions for Tom? I think not. Okay, thank you very much, Tom, um, uh, for collating all that information from around the Highlands and Islands. Um, Maybe we can uh, crack on now to our final speaker, who is uh, Jeff Ballinger. Um, Jeff, would you like to introduce yourself or would you like me to introduce you? And you're muted at the moment. Oh, no, he's gone. Ah, he started. Excellent. Why don't, why don't you introduce me while I get my technology sorted out? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeff. Okay, so um, Jeff apparently doesn't describe himself as a proper naturalist, but he does like looking for watching and photographing butterflies, which to me sounds like a naturalist. Um, so um, apparently after many years of... Uh, really looking for butterflies uh, abroad. Um, Jeff and his wife Gail have spent lockdown turning their attention rather belatedly to Scottish butterflies. Yes, well done. So there's some good, good, good things about COVID. Um, so uh, the reason Jeff's been invited along to this meeting is that I'm very keen that we make a bit of an effort in the Highlands to uh, look for purple hair streaks this coming season. And um, in uh, summer of 2021, last year, Jeff and Gail saw their first purple hair streak, um, got hooked and have spent a lot of their spare time chasing around trying to find them in various sites in Stirlingshire, West Lothian, Fife and the Borders. Um, so I'm hoping to um, use Jeff 
the and Gales experience of what they found further south in Scotland um, to help us try and um, nail this one down in Highland. So over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Pete, for the introduction. Um, first off, I think everything should be working now. Can you see my title slide and can you hear me clearly? Yes. Excellent. That's always good. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and tell you a bit about our, uh, I describe as a pursuit of the purple hair streak through central and southern Scotland over the last year. And I will then lead through into speculating a bit about where you might then do that in Highland and why you might want to do that in Highland. Uh, lots of good reasons, we'll get to those. Um, but the main focus of the talk is going to be to try and give a sense of the of the fun we've had doing it and why you might want to do it too. So before we get to the hair streaks, really a little about us. I have just, I've, as Pete said, I describe myself as someone who enjoys watching and photographing butterflies. I am no means a great expert, but this is what we like to do. So there's a picture of Gail in her happy place. She's in a mountain meadow full of butterflies. That's where she likes to be. And then you've got me there in the on this side in the tropical environment of Holyrood Park in Edinburgh, chasing Scottish butterflies. It's almost could be as tropical on both sides, but it's been, it's been a good few summers, the last few summers, learning about Scottish butterflies and why we should be looking for them more as much here as we do abroad. So yeah, our lockdown project last year was to find and photograph every species of butterfly in the East Scotland branch region and collate some sort of presentation about that. Um, and that was going all very well. Um, and by mid-July, we had everything except the Scotch Argus and the Purple Hair Streak in the bag. Um, we never actually got as far as putting that project together, probably for the because of Purple Hair Streaks. So we, we, Scotch Argus weren't going to be a problem, but a Purple Hair Streak, we've never seen a Purple Hair Streak in the field before, so that was going to be a challenge. So, first, before we get into the pursuit, wh wh what do we know about purple hair streaks? And this is a very useful composite of the life cycle that Chris Stamp, whose name is going to occur several times in this presentation, uh, prepared and I've stolen along with several of his other materials. Um, the eggs are, now, the egg in the original composite is in here. I thought that was a little difficult to see, so I've added a, one of my own pictures of eggs there just so that we can see what they actually look like. They're laid between the buds of usually pedunculate oak and they're laid in uh, September, uh, August, September time, and they remain there right through the winter until the spring. Um, they, with the first few instars uh, feed it on the buds themselves. They burrow the way inside them and eat, eat them from the inside out. Um, and then as they get bigger, as our friend over here is getting, um, then they, they start eating the leaves, usually at night. Um, uh, and and, and from, from there, they descend to the ground. And we've got one down here that's begun to pupate and is being looked after by a friendly ant. They're one of the species who do seem to interact with ants, so details of that seem a little, a little vague in most, most of the presentations on it. Um, then, they obviously are pupating, out come the adults, and we've got a set of images of the adults here. I'll start with the one at the top left here. This is the underwing of both sexes are essentially identical. You can't distinguish the sexes from the underwings. Um, we've got uh, a male over here and a female down at the bottom left here. Um, the underlying color of, in this sort of, picture, uh, an idealized picture, you see lots of purple. The underlying color of, of, the, of the upper wings of the butterfly is actually chocolate brown. So like the color you can see at the base of the female's wing here, and again on the towards the base, that's the color you tend to see. Um, the female's purple is permanent. It shows in all lighting conditions, but otherwise it's chocolate, br chocolate brown around the outside. The male looks like a little chocolate brown butterfly until the sun hits it just so, and the purple shows. So they're quite a stealth butterfly in that sense. They, they not necessarily obvious color that you're looking for, and per, the word purple can be misleading. 
Um, so where, where do you see them? They live entirely in the oak canopy. They feed on aphid honeydew. Um, they're totally an arboreal butterfly. So if you see them on the ground, there's usually something going horribly wrong for them. Um, you'll typically see them jousting or the males and one or two long suffering females in a jousting display, jousting and chasing display on the west facing side of the treetops of oaks in the evening sun between 6 and 8 p.m., but maybe a little bit wider than that, a little bit earlier than that, when you to get towards sort of the end of August. Um, and they're there from the sort of second half of July in Scotland. Down south, they, they start slightly earlier, but up here, it's really not until the second half of July. Um, as ever, lots more details to be found about them in Peter Reel's book. That's where I go if I want to remind myself. So that's the purple hair streak. Down south, pretty common. Um, I think, for, as Steve said earlier, um, it's probably not something he thinks of as a particularly exciting butterfly to find. Um, but once you get north of the border, they very much peter out. There's a few exceptions around uh, Glasgow, the Trossachs and Stirling area. They've been reasonably solid. Um, and a few, a few other spots, if we're looking at these slightly older maps um, and looking towards Highland, obviously some records up here. But there's lots and lots of blank areas when you look at the distribution maps that are in places like, I mean, this is NBN on one side and the butterfly conservation map on the other. Um, I wonder if, that's, wonder if that's really true. One thing it's always worth thinking about these maps, I've just picked one of these records out here. This is from 2013 on Mount Lothian. Um, and it's on an area of Heathland and it was recorded in June, in early June, 2013. So that is certainly not going to be a purple hair streak. So we do have to be a little bit cautious in looking at some of these dots and going, there'll definitely be one there. Um, that's probably someone just going to the wrong column on the spreadsheet and it probably was a green hair streak when they started entering the record. That's a speculation anyway, we don't actually know, but fairly unlikely that's purple. So we were wanting to go and find purple hair streaks. So we, we follow uh, the East of Scotland Facebook group and Chris Stamp, who's a great enthusiast for these things at the beginning, at the, in, this was in June last, last year, posted a, a better, more updated map of where they've been seen through the, through the East Branch region and beyond. Um, and you'll notice in recent few years, they've been filling in a few more spots. The orange spots there are ones they've filled in more recently. Uh, but this this is the situation at the start of 2021. So we're we're great situational awareness for us to go and find our butterfly and to photograph it. Then it got exciting. 21st of July, Chris shared another another post on the say on Facebook saying that he'd just discovered a fantastic new site for them. And this was on the River Leaven, just as it leaves Loch Leaven in Fife. So next night, that was on 21st July. Next, next night on the 22nd, finished work, jumped in the car headed off to Fife and we saw our first ever purple hair streaks immediately. Bingo. Wonderful. They really do live high up in trees. This is a this is a picture Chris prepared to guide people into the site. And if you walk into that site, you come in across that bridge, pathway goes around the corner, and then right up in the treetops above you, on these sunny face sunny sunny facing edges in the evening, you're getting your purple hair streaks fluttering around. Top left, is how you often see them. Not much purple going on, mainly brown, but it's a fl flittering butterfly. And the other color which is dominant when you look up into the treetops and see them is you see the pale underwings. You see a flickering pale underwing. Um, so that, that was fantastic. And this is a, a nice one. This is one where the, where the sun is bringing out the purple in, in, from the upper wings of the male. So that was fantastic, job done. Um, or was it? Because Purple hair streaks, I need to give you a health warning. They are very, very addictive things. Um, Chris described them in one of his posts as the crack cocaine of butterflies. And I think that's about right. Once you start, you've got to have more. So we decided from here, I mean, we'd got our photograph, surely we should be off just completing our project now. No, we're going to go and try and find just one more site down on our own side of the fourth. So, took a clue. From iRecord, in this case, this was from Nigel Voden and, um, in 2020, where he'd seen 
No, this is an example of one on the ground. That, that is a very unhealthy propeller streak. It has obviously been washed down and smashed up a bit, which is why it was found on the ground. But it gave us a, a clue of where to start looking. This was at Calendar House in Falkirk. Um, so next evening, we drove up the M9, up to Junction 5 on the M9. This will become a theme. Initially, didn't find anything very definite. A few shadows flitting around high in the trees. Lots of big, big trees there, big oak trees. Um, but then we went out onto a convenient tea mound on the golf course, which is just down the west side of that bit of that of those grounds. And looking back towards the trees, we got a clear view of two individual butterflies flittering around. Nothing like as many as Loch Leven. You really, we only saw two butterflies around this tree, but that got us our sighting. Got some more pictures. Excellent. Very successful. We also had a, a third one just as we got back to the car in the car park, come and buzz around us, blow some raspberries and head back into its tree. So it was a third sighting. They're very easy butterflies not to see, even when they're there. Very successful, but that was still in Stirlingshire. We want one in Lothians. So on we go. Uh, second clue was uh, these, some, these older records from MBN um, and such around uh, Muir Haven site um, in, in just in the very bottom corner of Stirlingshire there. Um, never, it's a New Raven side country park, never been there. So we jumped in the car again, off up the M9, junction four this time, and had a good long walk around. Nothing doing initially, the usual theme, very hard to find these damn things. Um, but then, and this is a little map of the, uh, the forest car park at New Raven side on the access road end where we'd parked and we'd walked off down into the estate proper, which is down off the bottom of it, of this, and done lots of walking around, but just came back up the car park and looked out over the fields past a Beware, the, a beware what Livestock sign, um, and looked out to this little wood, steep wooded knoll out across the fields. And just that, that looked the right sort of place. So we took a walk out across the fields and this was the best site we found all year, just within this knoll. Really intense activity. And because of the shape of the knoll, but you can stand up on top of the knoll, you can look back at the tops of the trees and you're really up at the level of the butterflies. So we got our best photographs of purple hair cheeks um, in the, in, on this site. We've got a female here with its proper purple showing all the time, a bit of underwing here. And this was a male with nicely reflecting in the sun. Um, it's fantastic, um, but it's still in Stirlingshire. We want to take, we, we come from Edinburgh, we want one in the Lothians. Um, so on we went. Third set of clues, we followed the ancient oak. This is the ancient tree inventory of uh, Woodland Trust, um, which I think is a great resource for this kind of thing. Use it to identify this awesome tree at the House of Bins, huge old oak tree. Um, so again, next evening, M9, junction, the junction three this time. And we found, to, you know, the wonderful site, oh, this big oak, lots of other oak. And again, an evening of tromping around, hot and, in this case, it was a really hot evening, hot and bothered. It really, I can't be bothered with this anymore type of thing. I've been going for hours. Gave up, sat down by the fence, had a cup of coffee, just idly scanning the treetops. 20 minutes later, and there's a theme in that, it's an important thing in that, bang, we got one. And this was just scooting around quite low down on an oak tree. And we think it was a female scouting for sites to lay eggs. Went back a few more times to House of Bins over the next few days and saw a few more. These are males perching much more traditionally high up in oak trees. Um, but but excellent, found them, found them there. First record in West Lothian ever, so we're really happy with that. This addiction's really building at this point, as you can tell. But then it got really mu very much harder as we headed towards Edinburgh. Uh, lots of evenings tramping around with no result at all. Got one view of one at this, this is at uh, Philipston on the, Uni on the Union Canal. Got a, got, some, got a spotted one there, but no pictures. Um, various other places where we saw none at all 
Then we had one which was very interesting and challenging hit at Dunnington Farm Cottages, which is almost getting to the bottom end of the fourth bridge. I'll show them up in a minute. Um, where we saw movement, we kept seeing movement up this oak tree. Never actually saw a butterfly direct properly. Never, never saw it clearly enough to say that's definitely a butterfly. So I just took some pictures of the tree, uh, of the foliage areas where we were seeing movement, and then brought them back for the nice big screen at home. And there, and this is the original frame of, this is taken with a 400 millimeter lens pointing straight up a tree, so it's a relatively zoom anyway. Crop out this little tiny corner of it, and you just see the underwing of a slightly raggedy purple hair streak. I was very happy with that result. That that's a, irritatingly, it's one kilometer short of the Edinburgh city limits, which would have been nice a nicer result, but it was still a new 10k square. So happy days. Do I, yeah. So never never saw this butterfly actually either through the binoculars or the viewfinder as we were going. So th th this is a, a summary of of our romp down the M9. Um, coming coming from Calder House, Muir Avonside, House of Bins, and then Duddington Farm Cottages. Uh, other people have since found a few more in this gap. Um, we've got uh, one by Mark Hubert, which is kind of about here, and then uh, Duncan Davidson found eggs in it at, at um, Bonnington House, which is just about here. So there's plenty of them obviously happening down here, but then lots of negative results as well. All the red crosses are where we looked and didn't manage to find any. All the orange crosses are where other people looked and failed to find any. So it does seem to interestingly stop about there. Interesting to speculate why, but that's a talk for another day. There's no way we've got time for that today. End of the season, we took this all a little further. We used our usual clues and we took it down into the borders. Um, so we've got a site with historical, rec an area with historical records at the foot of the Edens, of the Eldens, sorry. We've got a cracking collection of ancient oak around about Ancrum. And then we put those two things together and we went to Hearstains, a uh, visitor centre and walked around. Theme, usual theme again, tramp for miles, sore legs, sat, settled on a picnic table. This is where we settled on a picnic table in the plate park of all places and just peered up at the huge oak trees. The oak there is amazing. And just look at this little patch of this oak up here, because we'll be seeing it again in a minute. Idly scanning the tops, drinking coffee, about to drive home in disgust. And we saw at one point up to three agile little hair streak style butterflies. Uh, I know they've seen hair streaks, whether they're white lighter or purples in the treetops. They know, you'll know, know what I mean about the movement. They're very distinctive fly. And, they're pale, and they appeared pale gray, but this is 150 feet up an oak tree. I did not get still pictures. Um, this is a frame grab from a video I took on my third, on the third night, night we were down there trying to get it. Um, the red line is the flight of the butterfly through about two seconds of that video. It, they shift. And this little dot up here <laughs> is the butterfly. So see if you believe that's a purple hair streak or not. Still to be proven, I would say. Um, but it's it's at this was the last week of August, between six and seven p.m. on the on the sunny tops of oak trees. There is a complication at Hairstains because this is where, uh, as Steve was, Steve was mentioning earlier, white letter hair streaks are coming north. This is where they meet. The, what, there are white letter hair streaks at this site. I was uh, this this winter. I've been looking at the eggs and taking pictures of the, the caterpillars there. Um, and it's a fantastic site for those too. But this is probably at least three weeks too late to be a white letter. And there were three of them, they were jousting, and white letters joust in the middle of the day, it's purples, where purples joust in the evenings. On balance, it's a purple hair streak, but we were back there this year to try and get something a bit more definitive. Very frustrating, we didn't quite like what that one nailed down. If confirmed, that would be the first historical record in the border since the 1950s. That would be nice to get that too. We did spend a lot of this winter looking for eggs there, without success. Um, but speaking of eggs, you only have the a, a month in the summer to see them when they're adults. But you can look at the eggs for more than half the year. And a lot of people have had a great deal of success identifying sites just going on the eggs. So. 
we didn't have success in the borders with those, but we did have a couple of good sites we found in Fife. This uh, both at Octomocty Common first, and then all of this is at Pit Lair in Fife. Um, they're very, very choosy about where they lay. Uh, this is a site with loads and loads of big oaks hanging about up here where the adults have been seen, which is why we went and looked here. And they more or less only use this one small oak at the edge of the site for laying their eggs. On the south facing side, I said, for, for eggs, it's a south facing side. And obviously you need low enough oak edge to be able to get to it and, and, and find the eggs. Um, and we, we've successfully found that eggs there. This is, this is a nice one. This, is, this shows kind of how you see it when you're coming in with just a magnifying glass. Then when you get in there with the eyepiece and you do need an eyepiece to see these things, you, they're about 0.7 of mil, usual sort of size for the sort of a flag. Um, they're, they're, and, they're the, and they're the usual very, very beautiful structures. Um, and they're, they're, they're great to see, but you do need to find the right sort of edge and it's undisturbed. People regularly cut back oh, branches at that sort of level and chop all the ends off when they're clearing the edges of pathways. Oxygen would be common, we found eggs and we're just in the process of reporting them, came back the next day and somebody had strimmed the pathway and had chopped all the foliage off where the eggs had been, which was a little frustrating. Um, very, very small things. Another couple of little points of eggy interest. Um, here I am using a UV torch in, the, in, in, in twilight and they really, that makes them stand out quite nicely. Good way to find them. Here's one that's been predated in quite an interesting way. Obviously they hatch through the, the top of the, the egg as, as with all these sorts of butterflies. So that, that would be on the wrong point. But this is where something's gone in and enjoyed its, its food. And finally, here's, uh, we picked up some windfall twigs with eggs on them. And now we don't, I don't have the attention span for this sort of stuff. So we pass them on to Chris Ostick um, and he's looked after them for us. And one of them has recently hatched and it's just grown up now. And this is now it at its second in star and growing, growing nicely. Um, we went back to Pitlair last weekend and the eggs on the tree are still slumbering. So it's another week or two yet, I think, before they'll be coming out. So what have we, what have we learned? I realize my time is ticking on slightly here, so I'm gonna try and go a bit faster. They don't look very purple. Remember the range of colors. You see bright pale flashes is what you're seeing in the treetops when you're looking up at them. Jousting, adults jousting, chasing, bass. Also, at many sites where it's quieter, they're just seeing them quietly basking in the sun on the leaves in the upper west facing canopy of oak, usually oak trees or near oak trees, 6 to 8 p.m. Don't go any earlier. There's no point in going out any earlier than that. I'd, on, and ideally, warm, still days from mid July to the end of August. Sometimes you'll see hilltree females pottering about lower down in the early afternoon on the south sides, on the south side sides, usually laying eggs. And that's where the eggs end up on those south sides. Usually pedunculate oak, so that's certainly a strong preference, but it's an open question of whether they only use pedunculate. Obviously pedunculate versus sessile, that's a whole story to itself. Um, local, locally very intensely common, but usually very, very sparse. Um, so they're really easy to see when they're not present. So you've got to take your time, sit down, have a coffee. They either like the smell of coffee or because you have to have a, that time Linger time. I think it's probably about linger time, though. You never know. I like the smell of coffee. The distribution maps, I think, are an extreme case of where it's about the distribution of recorders. I suspect this may be the most common butterfly in Scotland, really. Um, who knows? But they are dangerously addictive. Lots of other people have been expanding the distribution last year. Um, I'm going to skip over most of this, but I'm going to pick out these up here, which are just from this win this this spring, where now half a dozen people have started finding eggs at sites in these side. And nobody's seen an adult up there. And quite a lot of quite regular butterfly type people do wander up and down through there. So um, they, they would have thought they would have been seen previously, but no. So that just shows how easy it is to overlook them. Um, another thing I'll just pick out is the sites on the aisles coming out. I, there's one here on, on Isle and Chris Elstick found them on Mall in the last year. So in quite what you'd think of as slightly remote places, maybe a theme towards where, what it's like around Highland. So what about Highland? There are some historical records. 
uh, that's at Round Forest. There are ancient oaks along the River Fintorn. So following my sort of usual pattern for looking for these things, I might go and look in that direction. Chris Stamp has suggested a whole range of places, which I think he shared with Pete previously, and I'm sure Pete can pass those on. Um, but really, wherever there's good oak, which has, has had continuity, obviously these are on the oak tree all winter. If you chop the oak tree down, that probably does for them. So it's, it's where you've got the continuity. But you would have thought up in Highland, you'd have much more chance of that having happened than possibly sites down in the Lothians where ships were built and industrial revolutions happened and lots of other nasty things that have done for butterflies. So would have thought there'd be lots of good sites in Highland. Obviously there are the known existing yeah, sites. I'm just actually finishing. Sorry. Uh, there are lots of existing sites would it be good to go I, I, in i record there's not many records of people having looked at that recently It'd be a good idea probably to pick those up start looking at them um good good way to get tuned in is to go to the existing sites because they are a different sort of butterfly to see but highland does probably have quite good habitat for this and given they've recently been found in quite remote places in aberdeenshire and in the islands surely there must be more of them out there just be a case of looking for them that's more or less what I want to say. The one other thing Chris Stamp has asked me to do is pass on that he's planning a field trip in, in Ballater um, at the end of June. Dates are still not being arranged. And he's going to let Pete know about that and would like to invite Highland Branch members to come and join. Because um, there's lots of enthusiasm now. If the eggs are being found there, we should try, try and go and see the, see the adults in the field there. So that's going to be, that's going to be happening. Uh, towards the end of July. Well, hopefully this little romp through has inspired you to spend a few sunny evenings in July and August out peering at, some, at the tops of some oak trees. If you find a, that calm, warm, sunny evening, it's a great thing to go and do. And you might sign some purple hair tricks where they've not been recorded before. Who knows what you might glimpse. Thanks for listening. <laughs> That's great. Many thanks, Jeff. Uh, would you like to unshare your screen? Here we are. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, I've. It, this is my last year working with RSPB before I retire, and I've got a, a four week sabbatical to take this year. So I've actually booked the whole of August for my sabbatical to concentrate on looking for purple hair streak in, in Highland. Um, one of the things that worries me uh, is that looking for these, uh, uh, going into woodland on a nice warm, calm evening in August towards the west coast is going to be a nightmare for midges. So I'm a bit scared about that, I have to say. But um, ho hopefully it might be worth putting up with a load of midges to get some new sites for purple hair streak. But as your maps show, Jeff, there's, um, you know, the, it's going to be well worth folk looking uh, further east, um, not going as far as the west coast, but um, looking at sites in Murray and um, the, the Great Glen and, and so on. So uh, there must be some uh, sites that aren't quite so midge fest uh, where there's a good chance of seeing purple hair streak. So, um, yeah, that was really, really interesting, Jeff. Um, some nice tips there. Um, I, I I suppose I've always got a slightly negative approach to these things that I can just envisage myself spending hours staring at some trees, getting midged, uh, eaten alive by midges and not seeing anything. Um, but hopefully uh, that will They are very me. easy not to see even when, they're, even when they're there. So it is a challenge. That's, that's where maybe trying to start at a site where you've got, uh, got, you've got a bit more, a bit of, to, to get an idea of what they actually look like in the trees, because it is a particular thing. Um, and, they, and get tuned into them. Um, the, the other key thing is equipment wise, you do need binoculars for this game. Yes. Okay. Well, 
I've got great binoculars that I use for bird watching. So uh, they a lot do. in common with bird watching, really, in terms of the equipment. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, yeah, that's brilliant. Um, I yeah, I I would urge everyone uh, in the Highland uh, to uh, um, yeah spend a bit of time at least this this coming summer looking for purple hair streaks. Um, as Jeff says, they're, they're undoubtedly under-recorded. And, um, yeah, that, that demonstration of um, or, or it, illustration in D-side of eggs being found in an area where loads of people will be um, wandering who would otherwise recognise butterflies. But I guess, you know, it's the evening thing. And... If you're interested in butterflies, you're, you're out during the day rather than the evening, and you're looking at the ground mostly, aren't you? Um, you're not. It's a totally in... different time of day. You've got it. It's a, it, it, you do what we we found is we go out for our normal butterfly walk in the afternoon, and then we twin that. We then we stop. We have a coffee. We have a bite to eat, and then come about six o'clock. We're then into phase two, which is all about those western sunny edges of, of good oak trees. Yes, okay. Um, anyone have questions for Jeff? <coughs> hmm. You've obviously explained it all so well, Jeff, that no one's got any clear questions for you. Or everybody um, now wants their lunch, I suspect. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. OK. So, um, yeah, as uh, as Jeff has so subtly pointed out to me, uh, it is getting on for lunchtime. So if there aren't any more questions, then uh, I'd like to thank the speakers very, very much for for their talks. And I'd like to thank Tom for uh, organising the Zoom and being in control. Well, that's a scary, isn't it? Having Tom in control of anything. Um, but um, and thank you all very much for uh, turning out this morning. Um, well, it has been very sunny uh, here in Strathspey this morning, um, but still really cold. And um, yeah, I wish you all the best for uh, this coming season. Hope you get plenty of moth and butterfly records. And, and yeah, Hillary's just said, don't forget to send all your records in, of course. And um, hopefully um, at our next meeting, we'll be able to meet face to face. Um, a lot of us who are doing a lot of Zoom and Teams meetings for our jobs are getting thoroughly sick of uh, Zoom and Teams meetings. So uh, it'd be so nice to meet up face to face. Um, so that's something to look forward to for sure. And uh, yeah, uh, unless Tom has anything else to say. No. No, just uh, just to thank you, Pete, for uh, chairing it so well. Oh, thank you very much, Tom. Audrey, anything to mention from you? Yeah. No, nothing okay. for me. <laughs> right. OK. All right, then, folks, thank you very much for turning out, spending your time and especially to this morning's speakers. OK, thank you very much. OK, bye. Thanks.